Well, welcome everyone. My name is Beth Gerstein and I'm the executive director of AMOCA. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, before we talk about the artists and the artwork in this exhibition, I would like to thank everyone who made the exhibition, catalog, and public programs possible. The exhibition and public programs were funded in part by AMOCA Circle members, the Boardman Family Foundation, California Humanities, Center for Craft in North Carolina, the Dew Foundation, Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Pasadena Art Alliance. I want to thank all the lenders who loaned to the exhibition and permanent collection donors who gave objects that are now in our permanent collection. I want to thank AMOCA's Board of Directors. I want to thank Pam Aliaga for their fortitude and humor while working on this exhibition and catalog. Elaine Olofsson Henry, who wrote the essay for chapter two in the catalog. Uh, for those of you who don't know Elaine, since she's not with us here today, Elaine is a ceramic artist, curator, and writer, and former editor and publisher of the international ceramics journal, Ceramics Art and Perception. Um, Amy McFarlane of Clean Slate Design, who designed our beautiful exhibition catalog that you can purchase uh, in, the gift in the museum store on your way out. Um, and all of the AMOCA staff who work hard every day to bring you the best programs and experiences at our museum and studio. It certainly takes a village to put together a project like this. I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to my collaborators on this project. Joe Loria, seated here next to me, uh, what served as the co-project manager, co-curator, and wrote the essay for chapter one in the catalog. Joe is based in LA and is an author and, author and educator who received her curatorial training at LACMA. She is a specialist in the fields of craft, design, and decorative arts. She has organized many museum-based surveys and national touring exhibitions and has authored more than 16 significant publications in our field. Some recent curatorial projects include Peter Callis, An Enduring Legacy, Mind and Matter, Five Bay Area Artists, Ralph Becerra, Exquisite Beauty, Silver Splendor, The Art of Anna Silver, and Connected Spaces, Michael F. Rohde and Cheryl Ann Thomas. She is currently AMOCA's adjunct curator and mentor faculty at Otis College of Art and Design. Also, Edith Garcia served as co-curator and wrote the essay for chapter three in the catalog. Edith serves as the managing director of communications at Enseca, which is the National Council for Education of the Ceramic Arts, and recently stepped down from teaching at the University of California, Berkeley, and at the California College of Arts in Oakland and San Francisco. She also was awarded the 2015-16 Viola Fry Distinguished Visiting Professor position at the California College of Arts. She just returned from McKnight Artist Fellowship and Artist in Residence at the Northern Clay Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Beth Ann Gerstein, the Executive Director of AMOCA for the past eight years. I've also, I also serve as the Vice President on the Board of Directors of Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts in Maine. Some of my curatorial projects at AMOCA include Making in Between Contemporary Chinese American Ceramics, We the People, Serving Notice, Julie Green, Flown Blue, Don Wright's Life is Not a Dress Rehearsal, Kakuli Velarde, Plunder Me Baby, and this exhibition, Breaking Ground. Breaking Ground, Women in California Clay, celebrates 44 artists who have defined and redefined ceramics over the past 100 years. We selected artists who had an impact on the field of ceramics through their work, their teaching, or their work for the field. Many of Golden State's most innovative and impactful ceramic artists in the 20th and 21st centuries are women who faced adversity due to their gender inequality uh, or were often ignored or overlooked in favor of their male counterparts. These incredibly determined women pushed forward driven by creativity and tenacity. Breaking Ground help, highlights the significant shifts in California ceramics over several generations of women artists. The story is told in three chapters using the artist's breaking ground period rather than their birth date to determine their place in this history. 
The story begins with trailblazing artists who laid the groundwork for the field and inspired successive generations of artists. The second chapter includes a disparate group of artists who explored or are exploring the female figure, feminism, and the creation of the perfect form, making a significant break in art making from their predecessors. The final chapter represents a younger or current generation of artists working to shift the perspective. Their work in many ways continues the conversation of the artists featured in the second chapter to diverse themes of politics, identity, and the environment. Assembled together for the first time in Breaking Ground, these, work tell, this, these works tell the compelling story of how women artists from California made and continue to make significant contributions to the American studio ceramics movement in profound and singular ways. And now I'd like to turn over the program to Joe Loria. So I'm encouraging you to strap in your seat belts because uh, my section of the show is all historical and um, we got a lot of history to cover. Uh, this pioneering group of women were at the forefront working in clay, pursuing venerated ceramic traditions primarily concerned with functionality. Their early pieces were characterized by technical perfection and a perceptive understanding of clay's materiality. Their achievements in wheel throwing, glaze development, firing, and teaching made significant contributions to the field, pushing ceramics forward to become a codified discipline in academic institutions. In this historical portion, the ceramics of 14 women are featured as their careers were pathfinding. And it, if this select group, the careers of six women are highlighted in depth as they laid the foundation for successive generations of California ceramists to prosper. It should be noted that of this six featured women, two of them uh, were partners and collaborators with their spouses. This is true of Gertrude and Otto Natzler, whose beautiful minimalist bowls you see on this screen, and with Vivica and Otto Heino. With these two women and their spouses, their professional work is considered unified, as it is treated as one creation in concept and execution, emanating from the hands of both partners. The six women that I will highlight were born at the turn of the 20th century, started careers in the early 1930s to the 1940s, and they held essential roles in the progression of ceramics in California. They are Susie Singer, Marguerite Wildenhain, Oh, the slides are just changing by themselves. Um, Gertrude Amon Natzler, and uh, you see that this is a, a, a portrait taken in, you know, at Brandeis Camp, where they spent their summers as artists in residence. Laura Andresen, and here she's in her garden, photographed by the famous art uh, photographer Imogen Cunningham, with whom she was great friends. And Vivica and Otto Heino, um, they're standing in front of their kiln at their Ojai's studio, uh, which they uh, ran uh, all the way until 2007. And then, of course, the inimitable Beatrice Wood, who lived in Ojai. So, as I said, Susie Singer was one of these women, and she was part of a, a triad of three women who were emigres who escaped the Nazi regime. She was first to emigrate, um, and she came here in 1937. But she started her career at the young age of 17, where she received a scholarship to study at the distinguished Weimar Werkstatt, the Viennese workshop. Because of entrenched gender roles, Singer was encouraged to concentrate on the applied arts rather than painting, which was her declared choice. Singer soon became a, an accomplished figurative sculptor, executing her small-scale pieces in the tradition of 18th century European figurines. 
She developed and refined the molds from which her sculptures were cast, and she perfected the decorative glazes. The figures were lauded for their romantic realism and were a commercial success. This feat was more remarkable considering that Susie Singer had a bone disease which was likely aggravated by malnutrition, which affected her mobility at an early age and confined her to a wheelchair in her later life. The threat of the Nazi occupation of Austria did not give Singer much time to enjoy her success. Being of Jewish heritage, Singer applied for a visa to America and arrived from Vienna to Los Angeles as an emigre, widowed, disabled, without financial means, and responsible for caring for her infant son. But she persevered. She set up her home ceramic studio, earned income by teaching workshops and private lessons, and sold her work in local retail venues. Singer's hand-built ceramics, which you see here on the screen, caught the attention of Millard Sheets, then the head of the department at Scripps College. In the early 1940s, Sheets offered her a teaching position in the extension program where she taught sculpture classes. She pioneered a method of hollow figure sculpting by wrapping thin slabs of clay around newspaper to form the parts of the figure, and then the newspaper would burn out in the kiln. This all might seem, well, well we all do that, right? But back then, it, wasn't, it was really um, path-breaking. Uh, Singer was also given a Fine Arts Foundation grant from Scripps to experiment with clay slips and glazes. With this grant, she created 14 finished sculptures for the art department, and they premiered at the second biannual ceramic exhibition of Scripps College in 1947, and this is one of the sculptures that was on display. She also did these very sensitive portraits of, of female figures. Susie's experience working with European industrial mold casting techniques, combined with her unique hollow figure forming methods, you say that three times, and her originated glaze formulas that vastly expanded the current knowledge of ceramic methods, materials, and decorative applications. Marguerite Friedlander Wildenhain was also forced to leave her home in Germany as the Nazis rose to power. But in 1919, at the age of 23, Marguerite Wildenhain began a seven-year program at the Weimar Bauhaus, a progressive German school. The Bauhaus curriculum provided a foundation in painting, sculpture, design, crafts, and architecture. Wildenhain um, ultimately decided the path of ceramic education and learned all the fundamentals of pottery production. That includes digging, sifting and wedging clay, wheel throwing, mold making, glaze formulation, and kiln firing. And remember, she's a very young woman. Uh, she had to be involved in all of this training. This enabled her to attain the status of master potter, and she was the first woman, woman in the Bauhaus ceramic program to earn this rarefied status. After completing her education in 1925, Wildenhain designed tableware for mass production for the Royal Porcelain Factory in Berlin. And you are viewing one of Wildenhain's designs for the Royal Porcelain Factory. This delicate and well-proportioned cup and saucer was designed as prototypes for German airlines. Wildenhain, being as brilliant as she was, included the design modification of a recessed hole in the saucer so the cup would remain upright during flights. Now I think we could use magnets. She also accepted the position of head of the ceramics department at the School of Fine and Applied Arts in a nearby town and married master potter Franz Wildenhain. Because of her Jewish ancestry, the Nazis forced her to resign from her faculty position in 1933. She left Germany for Holland and set up a pottery studio with Franz, which they called the Little Jug. Ultimately, she was forced out of Holland as well, um, and she emigrated to, the, to California in 1940. And the reason she came to California is her distant relatives, Gordon and John Hare, uh, had an idealistic dream of developing a Bauhaus-like craft community in Northern California where they lived. They convinced Wildenhain to join them. 
And uh, the idea was that this would be an artist in residence craft colony, and it was to include Marguerite and Franz as the master potters, a distinguished weaver, and a, an accomplished metalsmith, who together would teach their skills in a workshop setting known as the Pond Farm School. Construction began in 1942 at for Pond Farm in Guerneville, California, on farmland near the Russian River. The first workshops were held in the summer of 1949, and classes ran for a nine-week session. The concept was that the artist in residence would, would participate in making the community self-sustaining. However, like all utopias, the communal living, teaching, and farming equipment failed after a, f after a few years due to internal conflicts among the artists and the dissolution of the Wilden Haynes marriage. By 1952, Marguerite was the only artist remaining at Pond Farm. She purchased a parcel of the property and reconfigured the workshop to accommodate a ceramic studio exclusively, emphasizing disciplined instruction and meticulous craftsmanship. And you see here how it was reconfigured so that there were two uh, lines against the wall with Bauhaus style wheels, and there was an aisle in the middle where Marguerite could march down and look at the work of each potter on each side and give her critiques. So uh, um, part of the, the uh, attraction for Marguerite was that after she did the workshops in the summer, her, she would be able to spend the winters making her own pottery. And here you see her with a, a group of her utilitarian uh, pieces uh, that were you know, produced during that time uh, in the winter months. Uh, and her early pieces at Pond Farm were hand-thrown uh, functional wear with a glaze treatment designed to enhance the earthiness of the clay. And you can see this bowl on display for yourself. Uh, later in her career, she devoted her attention to sculpting bas-relief tiles and freestanding sculptures often with motifs based on nature. This is also on display. Wilden Hain ran the pottery for another 28 years until its closure in 1980. To Pond Farm, she brought her advanced abilities, technical standards, and European sensibility. She remained living on the property until she died in 1985. Many of her students became teachers and invited Wildenhain to lecture and demonstrate at colleges nationwide. These pond farmers, as they are known, became devoted followers, disseminating Wildenhain's philosophy where she valued working with one's hands, making pots, and the holistic benefits of introducing art into life. All of this she espoused in her book, Pottery, Form, and Expression, published in 1959. Notably, workshops she conducted in the early 1950s at Scripps College, Black Mountain College, and Alfred College, as well as the Archie Bray Foundation, came at a critical juncture in the American studio pottery movement. Two pond farmers that are featured in the exhibition are Martha Longenecker, who subsequently became the founder and director of the Menge International Museum, and Helen Richter Watson, who was appointed as the head of the ceramics department at Otis College of Art and Design after Peter Volkus vacated the position. Another dedicated teacher, like Wildenhain, was Laura Andresen. Uh, Andresen studied the history and methods of pottery at UCLA in the early 1930s and graduated in 1932. That is 90 years ago. <laughs> As expressed in an artist statement, Andresen remarked that when she was a student, there were only, quote, two schools in California teaching ceramics, UCLA and USC. There were few books, just one periodical, Limited equipment, no throwing wheels, no low, no low fire kilns, and very little communication with the world of ceramics." End of quote. In 1933, Andresen began teaching art at UCLA and founded the ceramics department. And I think this is just such a telling photograph of the teacher with one of her pieces in her hand and explaining to all of her students gathered around the work table. 
some of the, you know, the, the benefits. And look at all the books she has in front of her. Um, so she was a dedicated teacher and taught over 5,000 students during her 38-year tenure at UCLA, retiring from the position in 1970. Continue, to continue her own ceramic education, Andresen was proactive. She attended evening ceramic classes at USC, taught by Glenn Lukens from 1936 to 1940. And this is the kind of vessels she made after her education with Lukens. Uh, earthenware, hand-formed, with this beautiful uh, Chinese red, bright and glossy glaze, which was one of Lukens', Lukens originated glazes. Um, Additionally, she furthered her skills by taking private lessons with, with Gertrude Natzler in 1944 to learn throwing on the wheel while continuing to teach at UCLA. Soon Andresen became proficient at the wheel and devoted her practice to making utilitarian forms, primarily um, you know, the, the, the functional domestic wares like bowls, bottles, vases, platters and teapots, as you can see here, a selection. Andresen was committed to passing on her knowledge to her students, and she, and she felt that um, her philosophy was about purest of form, and she taught the European principle of form follows function. But to help her students understand all of the processes of making ceramics, she hired um, Imogene Cunningham, again, to photograph her doing the various techniques uh, so that she could share with her students. Uh, and this was, you know, this was the first DIY um, demonstration. By the early 1950s, stoneware and porcelain clays became available and extended Andresen's options. These higher temperature clays sent her on a journey of experimenting and developing glaze and firing techniques for this temperature range. And you can see from the pieces that her glaze investigations led to soft, earthy matte and ash glazes on stoneware and a range of satiny crystalline glazes on porcelain. As Andresen pushed forward with the technology of glazing and firing, she brought her students along with the discoveries. In the mid-1950s, she established an experimental pottery laboratory where students could formulate original glazes and evolve new firing methods. Andresen's professional career kept pace with her teaching with exhibitions on both the East and the West Coast. Highlights included a retrospective in clay presented in 1982 at the Menge International Museum in San Diego, and it was the culminating celebration of Andresen's work. And the exhibition was organized by her former student, Martha Longenecker. One of uh, Laura Andresen's students is here today, St Stephanie Grunberg, and uh, she was appointed by Andresen to be her graduate um, to be her teaching fellow, and, and Andresen asked her to assist the uh, incoming students with wheel throwing lessons and mixing glazes. She was also instructed to copy all of Andresen's original glaze formulas, which she has revealed she still has today, so you might want to ask her. Although Grunberg wanted to explore sculptural forms, both Andresen and her MFA teacher Takeizu, Toshiko Takeizu, discouraged her from taking that direction, suggesting she continue to perfect her throne functional wear. But you could see that Grunberg devised a way of combining wheel throwing and sculpture by constructing hollow figures from wheel thrown and altered cylinders. Other women uh, in the exhibition who pursued sculptural forms and had successful careers creating large-scale ceramics, some for architectural installations, uh, were Betty Davenport Ford and Elaine Katzer. Frequently, their subjects focused on the figure and animal groups which addressed the human, natural world condition. Another emigre are the 
Natzlers. Um, they were both born in Vienna, Austria, and they met when they were 25 years old and shared clay and affection for the remainder of their lives. Both had studied and nurtured an interest in the arts when they met in 1933. They took classes through the Viennese workshop of ceramist Franz Iskra and learned various clay processes, mostly wheel throwing for Gertrude and hand building and glaze development for Otto. In 1938, Germany seized Austria, this is becoming a theme with the emigres, and being Jews by heritage, the Natzlers married and moved to the United States. As a temporary means of support, they taught ceramic classes from their home studio to individuals who knew of their skills and were keen to acquire them. Two of those individuals just happened to be, as I mentioned, Laura Andresen and also Beatrice Wood. They, they were eager to learn will throwing from Gertrude and glaze chemistry from Otto. In 1939, their work was included in the National Ceramic Exhibition at the Syracuse Museum of Fine Arts, New York. Winning this prestigious award caught the attention of art dealers and museum collectors nationwide and launched their careers. The Natzlers represent a true collaboration in ceramics of partners who perform distinct and separate functions that resulted in a unified voice. Gertrude always threw the vessels on the wheel. They were impossibly thin-walled, clean-lined, and minimalist. In approximately 200 vessels she created per week. And Otto transformed raw glaze materials through calculated firing methods into dynamic surface effects which you can see here, originating over 2,500 unique glazes for Gertrude's pieces. The, the Natzlers lived their life um, with enjoying rich recognition. They won accolades internationally and earned a reputation as consummate artists. Their work was included in the groundbreaking exhibition Objects USA, organized in 1969 by Lee Nordness, who declared, quote, the Natzlers were among the most aesthetically distinguished in the history of ceramics. Uh, here I'm just showing you their signature glaze of the lava or the volcanic uh, surface treatment where uh, Otto managed to formulate a glaze that would blister out into this really beautiful texture. The Natzler's personal and professional partnership ended in 1971 when, after a long illness, Gertrude died of cancer. As collaborators, they demonstrated advanced technical knowledge and a refined synthesis of form and surface. Their work affirmed, for me this is probably the most important part of their career, it affirmed that a well-designed and executed ceramic vessel could be understood, discussed, and dissected by the same aesthetic standards applied to other art disciplines. And this concept is only now being accepted into the Western art canon. Another team, a pioneering team, were Vivica Place and Otto Heino. And um, Vivica had gone through the MFA program at Alfred University in 1944, was teaching at the New Hampshire Craftsman, and met Otto Heino, one of her students. They married in 1950 and relocated to LA when Vivica was offered a visiting lectureship position at USC upon Glenn Lucan's retirement. And she taught ceramics there from 1952 to 1955. Vivica actually taught Otto how to throw on the wheel, and they collaborated on pieces throughout their careers, participating jointly in all aspects of the ceramic process. Since they worked as a team in the studio, they always signed their pieces Vivica plus Otto, regardless of ownership. The Hainos found inspiration in historical Chinese ceramics and the gestural calligraphic drawing of Japanese potter Soji Hamada, who visited USC for several days of demonstrations. And here on the screen, you see one of their large-scale stoneware vessels that shows how they translated the vitality and spontaneity of Japanese brush painting to the pottery surface. From USC, 
Vivica went on to teach at Chouinard Art Institute from 1955 to 1963. By the 1960s, the Hinos became known as glaze masters, formulating a rich palette of original matte, shiny, and gloss glazes with distinctive luminosity oops, and um, texture. And I'm just showing you this lidded container, which is on display in the exhibition, because it's an example of one of the thousands of glaze experiments that Vivica and Otto executed while heading up their, their studios. As a teacher, Vivica Haino expected her students to model her work ethic, but she also inspired them to reach beyond their perceived limits. Many of her students ventured forth to become teachers or professional studio potters, including Dora DeLorios and Elsa Ratti, both in section two of this exhibition. <laughs> This is some of the, the, the kind of satiny glazes that they had formulated, all original from their studios. After a decade of living in the East, their friend and fellow potter, Beatrice Wood, invited them to buy her home and studio in Ojai, California. These pieces were produced in their kilns at Ojai. Uh, they simply called their uh, gallery and studio there the pottery. Um, and they remain committed to the idea of function in various domestic forms, including wall tiles that could be configured as murals. And they actually had a beautiful mural in their house in Ojai that had a leaf and botanical motif. Um, Vivica died in 1995, and Otto continued to make work and oversee the pottery and the studio until his passing in 2009. And the last of the trailblazers that I will discuss is Beatrice Wood. Of all the early pathbreakers, Beatrice Wood was probably the most visible of the group. Living to 105, her life spanned the 20th century and crossed art movements and disciplines. Before discovering her passion for clay, Wood explored painting, drawing, acting, and writing. After studying painting at the Académie Julian in Paris and training in the Parisian theater and acting in dance, Wood returned to her home in New York City in 1911 to join a theater company. This was pretty bold and bohemian for 1911. During this time, she also became a member of the Avant Group, the New York Dada, and assisted in developing Dada publications with Marcel Duchamp, one of the founders of the Dada movement and with whom she became lifelong friends. She also exhibited her paintings and drawings at Dada exhibitions. In 1928, Wood moved to Southern California to be near Krishnamurti, the Indian philosopher and spiritual leader, establishing a spiritual retreat in Ojai. Wood embraced Eastern mysticism and developed a devotion to India, its culture, customs, adornment, and craft. And eventually, she adopted the Indian sari as her preferred dress. But before following Krishnamurti to Ojai in 1947 and buying land and building her artist's home, studio, and exhibition space across the street from his residence, Wood would spend more than a decade in Los Angeles building her ceramics career. She started taking ceramics classes in the adult education department at Hollywood High School, aiming to make the kind of luster wear she had admired and purchased in a European antique store. Realizing that she lacked the necessary skills to work in clay, Wood also enrolled in a Glenn Lucan ceramics class at USC and also apprenticed with the Natzlers in 1940, learning to throw on the will from Gertrude and studying glaze chemistry with Otto. So this bowl that's on screen shows uh, its refined shape and textured volcanic glaze demonstrate the influence of her training with the Natzlers. From early in her career, Wood made two distinctive bodies of work. Utilitarian forms are forms that referenced function, and small figurative sculptures that later in the 1970s transformed into large figurative tableaus that frequently lampooned morality and politics and poked fun at gender roles, such as the case as this tableau, Good Morning America, which tackles the subject of prostitution with a bite of, scar of sarcasm. 
It was, however, her lusterware work that brought her the most notoriety and attracted the attention of galleries and museums. And here you see Beatrice um, before her trip to India in 1961, uh, mixing glazes in her Ojai workshop. Through experimentation and with advice from lifelong friends Vivica and Otto Heino, Wood perfected luster glazing and achieved a shimmering assortment of iridescent hues, which she applied to dazzling effect on her vessels. Wood lived to see her centennial celebrated in a tribute exhibition when she was 104 years old, organized by the American Craft Museum in New York City and traveling to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Her home is now a historical house and art center, the Beatrice Wood Center for the Arts in Ojai. Of all the pioneering potters of this first generation, Wood's lifestyle, her writings, especially her her autobiography, I Shock Myself, and ceramics most fully captured the zeitgeist. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth Gerstein, who will talk about the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And now that we have such a great base history, uh, we can launch into chapter two, uh, which has the theme of the body politic. It's a desperate group of artists who explore the body itself, the body as a vessel, the interaction of body and objects, and feminist ideals. For centuries, pots have been compared with the body, considering the names we have bestowed on their parts, the lip, the belly, the foot. Sandy Simon, committed to following a path similar to her teacher, uh, Warren McKenzie, to be a functional potter, Simon has also committed herself and her resources to the success of other studio potters with the creation of her gallery, Tracks, which she opened in Berkeley, California in 1994. Simon's signature approach to function includes small fired-in wire handles embellished with simple ceramic forms for easier gripping with a surprise of color in the inside of the vessel only visible to the user. Functional pots bear the mark of the maker by fingerprints permanently fired onto the clay surface, throwing rings from the maker, or a simple elegant handle or the addition of a decorative seed. Anna Silver maintains a commitment to functional forms and supersizes them to create an Alice in Wonderland type canvas for her energetic brushwork and colorful palette. Silver studied with painter Fernand Leger in, Par in Paris in the early 1950s and then returned to LA to study at Otis Art Un Institute where she studied with Helen Richter Watson who is included in chapter one in the exhibition. Silver's work disrupts the viewer's cultural frame of reference, challenging familiar concepts of size and purpose. The scale of the work alone provokes questions. What is a teapot if not filled with tea? The effects of Silver's challenge is delightful. On these oversized canvases, Silver creates masterpieces of abstract expressionism distinct from other artists working on the West Coast at the time. Nancy Selvin trained as a sculptor at the University of California, Berkeley, receiving her master's in art in ceramics in 1970, where she learned lessons of scale, volume, and composition while studying with Peter Volkus. In the 1980s, she shifted her work creating still life tableaus that reference functional objects, such as cups, books, uh, bottles, and flasks, but they're clearly not functional. Selvin said she wants to make it totally clear that these bottles aren't for use. She likes the concept of referencing functional issues, but doesn't want to be bound by function, which she finds limiting. Many of Selvin's pieces are overlaid with snippets of text or drawings, a strategy she frequently uses to create pattern and provide visual intrigue. The text is excerpted from different sources and may include passages from poetry or phrases from art essays. However, most often the words are transcribed from her notebooks, alluding to thoughts on art and philosophy or to specific ceramic techniques and glaze calculations. The text is not meant to be literal. 
Selvin uses it as a device to draw the viewer in at close range, demanding a little more time to reflect and savor the sculptural forms. Elsa Ratty was born in New York City and took her first ceramic class at the age of seven in New York, at New York's Greenwich House Pottery. A friend and classmate was the daughter of art collector Arthur M. Sackler, who introduced her to Chinese ceramics from the Song Dynasty, an impression that stayed with her and would later influence her work. From 1962 to 66, she studied at Chouinard Art Institute, now CalArts, where her instructors were Ralph Becerra and Otto and Vivica Heino. The sensual curves and lines of Ratty's work defy their functionality. They are too elegant and too lovely to think of using every day. They are studies of form, fluidity, and sensuality. You can't help but focus on the bowl's lines and edges, her unadored pieces show the influence of the Song Dynasty wares. Magdalena Suarez Frimkis was born in Venezuela in 1929. In her mid-30s, she was offered a fellowship to the Clay Arts Center in New York, where she met her husband, Michael Frimkis. They began working together shortly after they met and worked in separate corners of their studio, with Michael throwing the pots while Magdalena painted the surfaces with elaborate glazed compositions. By the late 1970s, Magdalena began incorporating cartoon characters, advertising slogans, and family snapshots on Michael's vessels. During much of her 50-year collaboration with her husband, Magdalena embellished the skins of his classically thrown, incredibly thin vessels with ornamentation that included Aztec and Mayan imagery, as well as whimsical cartoon and pop characters. Also featured in the exhibition are some smaller works. Um, the smaller works would have been both sculpted and painted or decorated by Magdalena. Karen Koblitz is a Los Angeles-based artist who pays tribute to the functional roots of ceramics while exploring historical and decorative elements. The influences seen in her work come from life experiences, her travels, and her readings. Uh, Arts and Crafts Still Life 3, featured here, uh, references the color palette, patterns, and forms of the arts and crafts movement. She's incorporated uh, vessel forms that are not functional in the still life. In this piece, um, called Muhammad's Line, Islamic and Italian influences are front and center, and the form is based on a tulipiere, which is an ornate vessel in which to grow tulips where each opening accommodates one bulb with a larger common water reservoir at the base. Clearly figurative in form, Rosalind Delisle's quintuple one and two represent very stylized females and display the impeccable sense of form that is perfectly proportioned and perfectly executed. She cites influences the supremist, su suprematist drawings of Kazimir Malevich, the constructivist theater and ballet designs of Oscar Schlemmer, and the line drawings of Picasso. Delisle said, my work operates on the vertical because I think of the pieces as people. When I throw, I often feel that I'm allowing a form to materialize rather than forcing one into existence. Even though every piece begins with a highly precise drawing, I find it easy to let go of preconceived ideas and just throw. Working in a restricted palette of black, white, and cobalt, the finely turned and stacked totemic forms are simultaneously mechanical, yet surprisingly fluid. Coily McLaughlin Hooven studied ceramics at the University of Illinois with David Chainer. In 1970, she moved to Berkeley, California, uh, when she saw the ceramics field on the West Coast uh, being fo much freer and more open to exploration. Uh, McLaughlin Hooven work per personifies human emotion both through the handling of the clay and the stances of her subjects. In The Lovers, which is this very intimate piece, the casual conversation of the two animal figures in human clothing is reinforced by the seemingly effortless way in which the thin clay elements casually hug the figures and appear untouched by human hands. This sculpture conveys some tension by the fact that the two animals are permanently joined at their bases. 
Rumor has it that she dated this particular PhD. <laughs> Don't know if it's true, but now it's, now it's taped. <laughs> Judy Chicago, although the feminist art movement in the West began in the 1960s, Judy Chicago's breakthrough artwork, The Dinner Party, was completed in 1979, and it broke ground for those who followed. The monumental visual history of women in art was considered the first feminist artwork, combining materials and techniques that were considered women's work, such as china painting, embroidery, and sewing. The dinner party represents 1,038 women in history. 39 women are represented by individual place settings, and another 999 names are inscribed on what she calls the heritage floor on which the table rests. Featured here is one of the test plates for the dinner party, and this test plate is Mary Wallenstonecraft place setting. Wallenstonecraft was a British writer, philosopher, and advocate of women's rights in the late 1700s. Until recently, her life, which encompassed several unconventional personal relationships at the time, received more attention than her writing on the topic. Today, Wallenstonecraft is regarded as one of the founding feminist philosophers, and feminists often cite both her life and her work as important influences. Broken Butterflies was created while Chicago was working on the dinner party, which was so demanding a project that there were times she feared she would never complete it. She decided to express her anxieties in a series of broken china painted porcelain tiles in which butterfly image was attempting to fly. When they were completed, she would break them apart and then place them in a coffin-like box. Without the groundbreaking work of Judy Chicago, artists would not be as empowered to make bold feminist work today. She broke ground for a generation of artists who carried the torch of feminist art. Chicago let us know that personal is political and this body politic carried and carries the torch for the next generation. We follow up with Phyllis Green. She began her professional career as an artist, educator, and curator in Los Angeles, and she's here with us today. Her practice integrates gender politics within the sphere of craft, though she has worked in video and installation. Green is primarily an object maker who represents the body. The Turkish bath, bath series featured in the exhibition was inspired by painters in the 19th century of Europe who were enthralled with painting harem scenes where female nudes were depicted in rom romanticized scenes of captivity. The mixed media objects in these works are hybrids of male and female forms. Green wrote that forms are, per are perforated and projecting, hard and soft, inside and outside. She goes on to say that the use of clay in her sculptures continues to be devalued by the art establishment, if not by the culture, in broader terms. One of her intentions is to challenge the lingering modernist assumption that decoration and ornament as feminine are enemies of high art. Marilyn Levine, Canadian born, began her career as a chemist, becoming interested in art and ultimately ceramics. When unable to find a job as a chemist, she took some classes in art. During her MFA studies at the University of California, Berkeley, she began to make trompe l'oeil work that are her trademark. Levine explains, leather is nice because more than any other material, it forms a record of its own history. It develops permanent wrinkles, it takes on the shape of the wearer, it records areas of abrasion, and it records areas of soil. It therefore becomes an expression of time. Margaret Keelan studied under Marilyn Levine and is represented, and the work is representative of the female body, uh, often young girls' bodies or dolls. The work can be sweet or sentimental or slightly creepy. <laughs> the work is evocative of weathered wood that has been abused or worn down. The surfaces are rich with texture, age, and experiences, not all of which were positive. Lisa Reinertsen is known for both her life-size figurative ceramic sculptures and large-scale public sculptures in cast bronze. 
She studied with Robert Arneson and Manuel Neri. Her works range in content from semi-autobiographical -autogra female figures with animals in clay to historic bronze monumental portraits of Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez. Uh, featured on the left is the clay piece that's in the exhibition, and featured on the right is the bronze version that's installed outdoors up north. Neptune's daughter depicts a young woman with a pelican cradled in her arms, and Reinerson hoped that the sculpture would serve as a reminder of the diligence needed to keep our waters healthy for our future. Dora Delarius, um, Elaine Henry wrote um, that Dora is a sculptor who, uh, who seemingly used wheel thrown forms as a means to an end. Delarius personifies animals to convey the human condition. According to her website, she has the ability to translate universal human dilemmas into mystical and transformative works of art. Her work has a universal appeal due to her ability to tap into the human condition. Her works show playful, gestural, and interactive figures, at times human, at times animal, and at times abstracted. The artist's formal training began at Dorsey High School and then at the University of Southern California, where she studied with black student Camille Bylops, were the only minority art students. Her status as a Latina in an art world dominated by white males is reflected in her concentration on the exaltation of the feminine form. Viola Fry studied painting with Richard Diebenkorn at California College of Arts and Crafts, so she would be taken seriously as an artist. She also studied ceramics at CCAC alongside fellow students Robert Arneson and Manuel Neri. Over the course of her five-decade career, Viola Fry produced an impressive body of work, including paintings, drawings, bronze, glass, and ceramic sculptures. She produced thousands of artworks during her lifetime. Frey used color and scale to evoke emotion. Frey's reclining red man is a man in repose. He's not active, he's not domineering, and he's not in control of anything that we can see. Curator Alessandro Vincentelli wrote, Viola Fry has never been limited to the strictures of craft ceramics, and her works draw on kitsch imagery with powerful echoes of folk art. Viola Fry's figures continue to grow in size and in strength, conveying a larger-than-life stature. The first and second generation artists provided an opening for the next generation of women artists to explore political issues, sexuality, and identity in their work. I'd like to especially thank Elaine Henry, who wrote the essay for chapter two in the catalog and provided many of the insights presented here. And now I'd like to hand it over to Edith Garcia. So welcome, my name is Edith Garcia and thank you so much Joe and Beth Ann for creating such a wonderful foundation um, and giving us so much historical knowledge on the background of what this exhibition um, is trying to do. For, for me, I'm very grateful to have the panel discussion in this gallery so you can view the works while we actually discuss them. The third generation have shifted focus simply from studio concerns as in you know, materiality, as in glazed structures, et cetera, et cetera, um, to urgent contemporary social and political issues impacting the now, right? So I'm gonna shift the perception of this conversation a little bit from like sort of historical context to what's actually occurring today in California. So following the framework, the curatorial framework for the exhibition, the third generation is a group of artists that generate works that reflect the now capturing the, preci the precise time and our coexisting lived experiences. I use the word coexisting lived experiences throughout my article or throughout the um, text in the catalog because I feel at times we forget that we are living coexist lived experiences and we all come from particularly different demographics and different backgrounds, but yet we are all here together in the now, in this present, right? So these artists address contemporary issues around politics, environmental issues, concepts of the feminine, the struggle of social structures, and the distinctive, distinctive challenges of everyday life. So, Breaking Ground, Women in Clay brings together monumental pieces such as Anna Valdez, 
oh, sorry, skip that, such as Ana Valdez and Annabel, Annabel Juarez, coupled with intimate objects such as Erica Sonata's uh, pieces capturing our contemporary culture as we live it now, here in this present, propelling artistic craftsmanship, excellence, and innovation into the new. These women artists cultivate change through the vehicles of contemporary objects, installations, performative practices, um, and here, as you see, we have Kathy Lou uses small servo motors and tinted yellow water as a powerful signifier to a call for societal change, specifically during the beginning of the pandemic. Today, women artists are shattering barriers, organizing moments of transformation, rewriting and unlearning art histories that ban their contributions to artists into, the art, into art history. Women are constructing the new steps right now, needed to climb onto previously intangible positions, right? Rightfully taking their place as the rec recognized leaders of change. So for me, um, being a curator for the exhibi this exhibition, I was very honored to have the opportunity to bring in new voices, right? To have the, bring in voices that haven't been heard or voices that are working yet, but haven't had the opportunity be to be placed within a museum setting. So, continuing on, Breaking Ground Women in Clay brings together the voices of leading contemporary women artists living coexisting experiences here in California, forging new histories and shaping the future, <laughs> the future of clay. These artists address contemporary issues, societal structures, and the distinctive challenges of today. I'm going to be begin with Brittany Mojo. Her work um, is considered or focuses on the concepts of the now, the nowness, this moment. How do we use objects to capture a precise moment in time? So the objects that you see here uh, in the now, uh, either or, uh, created in 2021, they're actually modes of coping and strategies of growth. Clay is an endless receiver of actions. If you work with clay, you know that it imprints your hand, it creates a connection to your heart, to your soul. So clay has that capacity. So she used this, these moments during the pandemic to create records or timekeepers of her experience in solitude in her space creating these objects. So these are literally time capsules of that experience, right? Um, Mojo says, these are both modes of coping and strategies for growth. I amassed bodies through the collection of simple movements, a coil was placed, a, a pinch was completed, all nows totaling these objects in seconds of minutes. So Mojo relies on layering duplication through techniques and pattern, all captured by the hand, the artifact of the now, right? Uh, a delicate object finds its opposite in a strong pattern. For example, we have the one with the crisscross there. So a delicate object created with its simple pinches, creating labor at times, embodying the haphazardness of their making. A strong pattern finds time and purpose through accumulation of actions in those pieces. So a very wonderful statement she said, just as now was then, soon becomes now. I got shivers. <laughs> so moving to Julia Half Candle, um, the piece that we have here when you entered. Her work, her work is a paradox of symbols, references, meanings based on the interpretations of the writings of American author, American author Ursula K. Lee Goon. Julia Half Candle's infinite series is a body of works with actually a very long accompanying glossary called the Infinite Glossary of Terms and Symbols, which you can actually download on her website. And I was able to research in order to get a better understanding of this work. This work for me embodies multiple concepts, actions, and ideas of what is the now and how we are able to, as humans or individuals, capture our experiences and our moments within objects. This piece, infinity, infinity, nothing, and everything, she calls it a living organism excavating, excavating moments in time. So she uses the concept of dots, dashes, and the excavation or the carving into the piece as an actual uh, excavation of moment in the timeline that we're in right now, right? 
So beautiful thoughts in terms of the philosophy of what ceramics can be. So Julia describes infinity, infinity, nothing, and everything as a continuous line throughout the philosophies of space, a dash in motion. She sees these as acts in development through time, grounded possibly only by their weight. The only present moment is caught in the mark of the hand on the, the surface of infinity and nothing as she takes out chunks of time are excavated in the white. So moving on to, oh, uh, in this piece, Julia Have Candles Swim, we have a lot of different interpretations of what this means. But for me, looking at her work um, as a curator, I see a delicate, beautiful, poetic balance in the way that she creates her objects. I see an encapsulated moment. I see her swimming through a river, swimming through muck, swimming through mud, swimming through clay. For me, I feel like when I look at review of this piece, I feel the tangible, tangible moment of water sifting through my fingers as I grasp this sort of monumental object in the next gallery space. As we move on, there is Annabeth Rosen, who is known for creating monolithic, massive pieces of artwork. Her sculptural works were groundbreaking in the sense that she was one of the first female artists to create large-scale sculptural works to sort of define or push against the male counterparts during that time period. Um, she's still very well known and respected for creating large-scale installation pieces um, and teaches in California. All right, so for me, there is strength and vulnerability. Kristen Morgan's work focuses on redefining the force of resilience, adaptability, and embracing the unknown moments that will create the future. In this piece, it reminds me of the moon. She uses fleeting and fragile, unfired clay. The objects that Morgan constructs are meant to perpetuate in its precarious and vulnerable state. Cardboard scraps, hard, hardcover books, shoe toys, number one dead coffee cups, uh, Christmas decoration, rocks, antique paper cups, and pencil stubs. When you view the object in the next gallery, you will be surprised to know there's actually six real objects within that installation. However, I challenge you to check, <laughs> to define which ones they really are. Because I personally, as even as a curator, could not pinpoint which objects, six real objects. And that just speaks to the level of her dedication and craftsmanship to her work. So she says, all of the objects I make have a kind of preciousness that is due to the fragile nature in which goes beyond sentimentality or the worth of material which they were made. The specialness of the objects that I make comes down to my display of skill and craftsmanship. I sometimes think these objects are slightly miraculous given that I make them with humble materials, unfired clay, compressed dirt, and paint. That is all, all right? The installation, in this installation, my goal was a formal exploration. I wanted to make a composition, a roundish composition, of mostly squarish parts, and many of these objects belong, this, many of the objects in the still life belong, belong to her father. So I feel like it was a momentum or a monument to her father, the previous piece. So moving on to contemporary issues as well. Kaiko Fukuwaza believes that art should represent its age, deliberate what we live through, challenge us to consider and act with additional awareness as we each shape our modern and future worlds. These beautiful pieces that you see here within these installation displays um, are, called, are from the Peacemaker series. Um, it is a direct response to addressing America's glaring gun culture and mass shooting problem. We have all, as individuals, feel we come a little bit desensitized to mass shootings at this point. We might be shocked when we hear of it, or we also might be desensitized since it happens so often. So these works are specifically to address American citizens' connection or desensitization to those works. Um, for this series, she has recreated the most 
used handguns and rifles in American mass shootings from the past 20 years and covered them with the state flowers for where each one of those shootings took place. And the titles represent the dates and at times the addresses where that violence has happened. In case you were wondering what those really long numbers were behind it. <laughs> oh, one fun fact um, I learned is that these pieces have also, she reached out um, to different craftsmen in China, and these objects were also manufactured um, in the same way guns are manufactured or outsourced, right? So she hired the most talented craftsmen in order to make the stunning flowers on the surface. I myself was kind of wondering how she was able to get that level of detail on the surface. So master craftsmanship at work. Another detail here, this one specifically talking about a gun shooting in Orlando, Florida in 2018. Moving to Joan Takayama Ogawa, her work, which is featured in the, in the last space of the gallery here, focuses specifically on Asian American struggles in the United States and comments on the roles in the 2018 economic crisis. She uses food to transmit culture. She hopes that the American anti-Asian sentiment declines, um, which unfortunately continues to grow as we have our COVID relationship happening. Um, she uses these miniature narratives portraying California's role in recent economic crisis, highlighting the exploitation of banks, homes drowning under the strain of overinflated mortgages, and depictions associated with envir environmental consequences of agricultural practices. So she works, or this work speaks directly to our overconsumption, to the battle citizens through the nation struggle with each day in the United States, homelessness, inflation, astrom <laughs> astronomical rental prices, a black sea covered in bias, debt, and a broken financial system that only supports the action of a accumulating debt. There we are, we all know what that feels like. We were just talking about student loans. Anna Valdez's installation. Um, she, Anna Valdez actually uh, studied as, as uh, Anna Valdez studied as an anthropologist. She produces environmental spaces reminiscent of primal settings, full of floral, fauna, bloom, and earth. Anna Valdez examines the intersections that impacted our recent collective experiences, prompted by her upbringing in California. Valdez generates projects that explore cultural heritage, materiality, our identities, and connection to our previous histories. This is a perfect segue into speaking specifically about the object of women. So the objectification of women is a well and ongoing, relentlessly, relentlessly tedious social structure. In this exhibition, artists challenge these outlandish and elitist concepts with grace and exquisite severity. Jenny had a Blumenfield nude figure vase drives the scope of her work and her presence in the field. She states, historically depicted by men, the female nude genre embodies a symbolic idea of beauty, the forbidden and the erotic. Blumenfield state, my body sculpture nude figure vase, which you have in front of you here, desexualizes the body through an anthropomorphized tendon of the vessel, reclaiming the form by removing it from the sexualization and objectified undertones within male depicted figuration. Annabel Juarez Musa Rebelde is a large flowing sculpture, flexing orange gown, contemplates freedom and the revolutionary spirit. It also emphasizes the absence of the body. And in this way comments, for me, the invisibility of women in the societal power dynamics. Dancer One, a monumental florical dress with elegant long sleeves, works to celebrate and honor women. At times, looking at Ana Suarez's works, you can see the absence of color, the absence of light, speaking directly to the struggles that women have in our societal power dynamics and the struggles that we have in everyday life as women challenging those systems. 
Kathy Lou's objects and installation are deliberately intensive and emotionally charged creations. Each one poignantly examines her experience as an immigrant to the United States. As Joe mentioned, immigrants coming to the United States have very unique experiences and must carve out their own spaces within this country. Each one poignantly examines her experience as an immigrant to the United States. These works confront the idealized notions of the American dream within the realities of racism, microaggressions, and unquestionably daily discrimination. In per peripheral vision, she considers and honors the women artists that have impacted her creative career. Within Kathy Lou's sculpted eyes that you have here on the side, you will find strength and perseverance to succeed as an East Asian American woman in the United States. She plays honor to Ruth Asawa and architect Maya Lin. This large composition of eyes and everyday objects, including the pails filled with liquid and plastic tubing connected to each pair of eyes, is a testimonial to the countless tears women might have shed through these lived experiences. A poetic tribute to the perseverance of one must have as an immigrant to a country that embraces at arm's length. Conceptual and research-driven projects drive crucial dialogues for change. Barry Zipperstein's work focusing on rigorous critiques of societal expectations placed on women, the intimidation of women artists, the systems in place to inhibit success. Barry Zipperstein continues to explore these ideas through her practice and create projects that amplify the urgency for change within societal narratives and the role of domesticity in women. Women in the Everyday, Christina Ree's installations are a gateway into smells and tastes of the home. For me personally, as a Mexican-American artist, I am transported into my grandmother's kitchen in Mexico. These objects are objects that you usually wouldn't see within ceramic exhibitions or installations, right? We see our own unique lived experience and we see captured moments within these, these installation objects. Her installations are tastes of the home, surrounded by de delectable sounds of laughter, memories, families, and a sense of belonging. These installations present to us memories of moments past. Within them, we have fractured memories transformed into conchas, nopales, clouds, corazones, smoking cigarettes and ashtrays, and emotionally fueled symbols that speak to our familiar. For me, as an individual, they encourage our, my, my mind to generate bright, colorful memories designed around our own familial experiences and work to magnify the emotions that echo within us during those moments. Each project is carefully curated to create points of departure and remembrance of past delights. Erica Sonata's work, Murmur, details the delicacy of a shared memory as it floats from one ear and then into another. A murmur much more impactful than a whisper accentuates our personal and societal anxieties. Her works are underscores the power these transient yet penetrating occurrences have on our reality. For her, the unknown of the everyday fuels her work, yet these sculptural works at time convey the sense of peace contemplation, and serenity. Monuments to the tranquility of the mind and craft of retelling of a tale. Kim Tucker fam Family Eyes is mischievous and full of whimsy. She uses humor as a vehicle to comment on the hard realities our relatives might throw around us. Family Eyes, a work dripping with the heavy glare and pressure brought on by expectation of others. The ferocity of marks cut on the surface speak to the intensity of emotion when she was making these deep scars on the surface of the piece. Bodies and mercenaries speak to portraying a finding of humor, beauty, and spiritual truths in our own imperfections. Her works mine the subconscious, our hidden desires, miscommunications, primer impulses, and spiritual redemption mixed together to become something new. These superhuman figures are manifestations of that inner world, primal beings, ghosts, and human dummies. They become more radiant human by expressing their true selves and true feelings.
They are quiet, comfortable in their awkwardness, reaching out for something new. Her work invites audiences in and offer a disquieting and humorous opportunity to ponder contemplation of nature and what it means to be imperfectly human. Breaking Ground Women in Clay celebrates exceptional women who share vision to bring transformation, build dialogues, and champion global awareness around societal structures, gender inequality, economic imbalances, erasure of women's history. These artists show us how to embrace making as an extension and manifestation of this time, welcoming challenges, growing resilience, innovation, and focus on creating collective supportive communities. Along with that, as we honor the floor beneath our feet, California continues to inform clay. For many California citizens, and myself being a Bay resident artist, environmental preservations and concerns are at the heart of our daily culture. Ashawini Bat, Retrembling Springs, speaks directly to her relationship as an immigrant to California. Deeply touched by its diverse and fragile nature and environments, she found herself drawn to its typographies. She sees this body as a work responding to the time of climate change, shifting habitats, and devastating forest fires. For all of us that live in California, we know what that's like. These, these sculptures respond to the endangered landscape of her adopted home, evoking both loss and regeneration. We're ending with Crystal Mori, whose work compels us to engage in critical conversations and actions it will take to save the resources that sustain us in California. The replanting, gorgeously sculpted, featured animals and humans adorn the tops of mountains of ecological waste. Plastic bottles and aluminum cans surrounded by sea coral are floating in at, the, at sea. These objects are a testament to our disregard for the wilderness that sustains us as a global community. We are just one part of this delicate ecosystem. When we bring destruction to it, we are bringing destructions to ourselves. As we work to embrace ourselves, we also need to remember to take care of the ground that feeds us and the ground beneath our feet. Thank you again to all the artists that participated in the exhibition and for sharing their intellectual scholar and rigor and for building spaces for the next generation of diverse women artists to elevate themselves in the field of contemporary arts. Thank you so much. So we have a little time um, for questions, if there's anyone that would like to ask specific questions of any of the curators. Um, we're happy to take questions. Sure, so the question was, you know, how was, the, how was the exhibition built, essentially, is what your question is. Um, and the, the show started coming together about five years ago, where we were developing lists of artists in the state over the last 100 plus years. And um, I then invited Joe Loria into the conversation because we started to figure out, well, what was the story beyond that they were women and they lived in California? Um, and we made a couple decisions. One was, um, you know, what did they add to this history? What was their, if we really came around to what was their breaking ground moment that had that impact. We also made the decision that we didn't want to do a huge survey show that included one piece by 100 women, uh, that we felt that you know, this was not meant to be a comprehensive statement of these 44 women are the entire story, because they're not. Um, they are just part of a much larger story. Chapter one is obviously a little easier to go, that it's clear who those trailblazers were. Um, it certainly gets a little muddier in chapter two and three of who should have been on the list. Anything you guys want to add? I just want to say that part of the attraction to this exhibition for me was to document and record the lives of women which are generally left out of the historical survey texts. So if you all look in your bookshelves, you will have an array of books that mostly are featuring the breakthrough moments of men. With the exception of Judy Chicago, I think most of you would have known about that work early on. But um, 
many of the others you will not find in your bookshelves. So that, for me, was the attraction to do this catalog so that now successive generations have a flashpoint, some place to go and to start their exploration of women who worked in, in ceramics in California. I mean, I can just follow suit. I think for me, the joy of being part of this exhibition and monumental project was the opportunity to elevate those voices that haven't been seen. Um, not just women, but also individuals of you know, color who haven't had the opportunity to be in like large museum exhibitions. So when they brought me on board, I was really excited to uh, recommend some artists that I felt were actually shifting the conversation, such as Erica Sonata, um, Crystal Mori was already on the list, but I felt like I brought in some new voices that can re really sort of help shape that conversation for the future and open up doors for other individuals to have the, those same opportunities. Was there another question somewhere? Yes. Thank you, Paul Roach. <laughs> um, yeah, we, that's part of what we do as an institution is to try to find support for each of these projects. Because uh, as you can see, just bringing the work in, a very expensive catalog, um, paying uh, all of the um, essayists and curators, um, paying for the shipping. Yeah, so you just have to, we rely on all of you, um, but definitely a lot of foundation grants as well. Great. Well, thank you for joining us again today. And uh, the catalog is available in the gift shop. And we hope you'll come again to future programs. Thank you. Thank you.